Yep. Yeah, the squat car on there. Okay, let's take a little bit out here as we do. And put it in the sun so you can see it. I'm just going to uh, measure the pH with the old universal indicator. Make sure you get stuff that's um, not been diluted down. So you can probably see there that it's um, it's orange, which is a pH of two. pH of two will fry off the roots of most plants, uh, CPs and CP related roots. Now. Um, in general, CP can just about handle um, pH of 2.5. Most peats and bogs and things like that are 3 to 3.5 sort of thing. Usually, you know, give you the nice yellow reading on your universal indicator. So, you know, standard peats and things like that. But, um, uh, you know, in the Eastings paper, they were talking about Venus flytrap sites for. Um, uh, 3.5 to 4.9 sort of thing, but they did say in parts of the paper they found some places which are extraordinarily uh, more acid than that. But they didn't actually give any figures uh, of how acid it was, but they did just mention that they came to some uh, much, much more acidic conditions and the plants were growing with nice red traps, I think they said, or something like that. So, um, yeah. Um, if we take the one quarter max rule and we assume that two will burn the roots off your plants and we take that as, as the lower limit remember it's a log rhythmic scale so um, so that will take it up to about um, so one quarter of that will be you know in other words it goes by um, units of ten so you know um, three is t uh, ten times less acid than two and four is less t uh, ten, t ten times less acid than um, or, or in other words three is Ten times stronger than four, or two is ten times stronger than three, is, is another way of saying it. it's more hydrogen ions there. So, but um, yeah. So if you take two as being the lower limit, they'll burn off the roots and plant. If you use the one quarter max rule of saying what is the absolute limit uh, for you know whatever you fertilise or whatever it is you're doing. Uh, and then take a quarter of that, you should be all right. So on a logarithmic scale, a quarter, it will be about uh, 2.4, I think, somewhere around there, 2.3 to 2.4 or something. So it's very close to the 2.5 that uh, we know the most CP. So, you know, taking an absolute approach you know, and uh, you know, a bit of speculation, it gets very close to what you actually find out by uh, actuality and doing experiments or things. So it's very, very close, very on the money sort of thing. So uh, I just thought you'd like to know that. And of course, um, this universal indicator uh, was developed and came out of um, bog ecology research in the Scandinavian countries. And um, if you look up, uh, where is it? Is, it? is this the one? So this is a, a two volume set by one of the four or five greats in hydrogen ion chemistry. You might want to say hydroxyl ion chemistry. <laughs> but it's got a chapter on um, the fertility of soil sort of thing. So you might just want to have a quick look at some of the pages on it. But, um, and things like that, you know. Yeah, various things, what they can do. This is just a basic one. This is from years ago, of course. So they had all this knowledge years ago. Some interesting things about their barley and red clover and things like that. Red clover. Yeah, okay. So, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, you might want to put some of that stuff. So, it's very interesting uh, bit of reading there. If you want to pause the screen and, um, and pass through things like that. Your reaction to plant disease and things like that, and you know, you've got all this thing about uh, finger and toe and stuff like that, the, ba the basics, and, and, and the theories of why it's so important, sort of thing. so so on and so forth. Uh, so, so, it's a nice little chapter there, but the important chapter in the other one is. Um, what came out of the Scandinavian countries with their um, 
uh, research into bog ecology. You know, the, the silver mirror test wasn't actually going to do it because if you walk in these places and you have to spend weeks walking in, this is back in the uh, early part of the last century, you have to spend weeks walking into these places that you've only got a couple of months to work on because it's um, freezing cold and, you know, you have to ski around in some of these countries or anything and they've got large forests and things like that you've got to get through. You want a really reliable test that's, you know, you can chuck it up against the wall and it still works sort of thing and, um, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Anyway, you might be interested in that. If I get to it. Nearly there. Yeah, oxidation, mobility, things like that, you know. Like, once iron is oxidised, it's basically immobile or something. La -di -la -di -la. Uh, Oh, they got a uh, machine there. I don't want to <laughs> do it like that. So, yeah. Anyway. Anyway, that's this is not the one I really want. It's getting out, out of the, uh, the thing now. So, um, I don't know. How many more pages? Right, oh, here we go. Nearly at the end. So, yeah, I can tidy up there. So you can have a bit of reading there for you. There are some interesting places. Okay, this is the one I want to show you. Is the got a whole chapter on uh, pH indicators, you see? Yeah, yeah. So this is a whole chapter. Uh, whole chapter. So this is more than that. It keeps on going. Colorimetric methods. You know, it's a <laughs> more than 50 pages. Um, they talk about theories of indicators and blah blah blah, you know, talking about um, using organic acids because they're very stable sort of thing. And if I can get to this, we have the universal indicator. So the universal indicator uh, was developed out of the uh, bog ecology research in Scandinavian countries because they had to have a method that was reasonably accurate, you know, within 0.5 of a pH unit, you know, plus or minus 0.5 of a pH unit because remember it's a logarithmic scale. Um, so you want to be, you know, really good. So, in other words, that brings in the one quarter Maxwell, if you were thinking about it that way, with half a pH unit. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, yeah, preparation and all these, and these are um, organic acids, you see, so they, they take many hours to make using concentrated sulfuric acid, usually as the catalytic, catalytic acid to get things to go. So once you've made them, they're extremely stable. They work at um, low temperatures, so they work in Russia. They work at high temperatures, so they work in the tropics. So, so you've got this reasonable accuracy all over the world under all bizarre conditions because you're using organic acids, which are uh, hard to make, but once you've made them, they're very stable, you see and they put them all together and of course they did it in a way where it's very logical one red for danger battery acid ph1 you got orange which is two yellow which is three green which is four you've got gray which is the, the, the neutral point which is um, ph on your um ph universal ph scale and um yeah uh, and then of course uh, pH of 8 is your phenolphthalein reaction where every, everything else is colourless, colourless but pH, uh, phenolphthalein is your magenta red, uh, pink basically. Um, yeah, your, your magenta colour sort of basically. And um, then the higher one, purple is much, much higher um, and so on and so forth. But uh, basically we're, if you're dealing with acid plants it's the lower end which is important for your colours. But um, as I said, red for danger, red for the colour of battery acid, which is pH 1, pH 2 is orange, of course, a nice orange-orange colour as the colour of an orange, uh, sort of thing. And 3, which is usually your colour of your peat, which is your pH of 3 or 3.5, as I said, it's got an accuracy of about plus or minus um, half a pH unit, sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, anyway, so... Um, Anyway, so 
this is how they did it in the old day, you know what I mean? And so uh, make sure you get a good one because um, it only works, they've got standards in this book for the actual concentration uh, of these different uh, indicators, you see. So, um, so basically, they've done a lot of work here. So if you get someone who's diluted it down, it's not going to work to standard, you see. So, you, you know, if you want that accuracy of half a pH unit, you've got to do it to the standard, you see. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it indicator, Im imitation <laughs> indicator color standards, yeah. <laughs> uh, all these ones they're selling you for a much narrower range sort of thing. So I say, no, stick to the universal one. The way I compare the universal indicator is like um, um, the bloke who did all the work with the binomial system. Um, oh, my, it, he slipped out of my memory. Anyway, so he invents the binomial system, and of course it's all developed out of Europe in, in European plants, you see. And it's really quick. You can actually classify plants very quickly on their sexual structures. Of course, they come down to places like um, you know, Australia, and this <laughs> wasn't part of the the, 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 develop, the uh, development of the system. Of course, they categorise things, and some of them don't fit. You see, and because of this, they poo-poo the whole system. A very, very quick system of cate categorising things. It gets you very close to an answer and then you can adjust with your local knowledge sort of thing um, unfortunately they put they basically poo-pooed the system and lost all its um you know power in a way people don't want to study it these days because they say oh you know it, it, it has these errors and mistakes in it you know especially with a country like australia sort of thing and other parts of the world you know that weren't discovered before them <laughs> <laughs> before the system was only up and running sort of thing but uh, this is what's happened today sort of thing and uh, apparently you can't lose a pink sh you can't lose a gay shovel in the sand <laughs> and no one wants to steal a gay shovel apparently so uh, this, this is the this is the blurb can't lose a gay shovel in the sand and no one wants to steal a, a gay shovel you don't want to see be walking down the street with a gay shovel Apparently, anyway. Anyway, it looks like they're starting to put in a border. But uh, as you can see, so that's probably going to go all the way around there. And I think the board's only on one side, so half a border. <laughs> it sounds a bit, it sounds a bit, you, <clears throat> it sounds a bit Ukraine, doesn't it? Only half, half a border. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, anyway, I thought you might like this one. I'm probably going to do a good, a good book tomorrow, so stick around for tomorrow. Hopefully this will be finished by, by roughly, and then I think they're going to dig over this part of the garden or something. But this book called Plant, and uh, has, even has a nice back cover. So we, it's gonna, we're going to be studying the carnivorous plant section of this book, which is somewhere towards the back. It's a very good, I like this book. It uh, gives you hope, I think. I think, I think like this book... It gives you hope. I've forgotten which chapter down here, but uh, as we get there, and it's quite a few. Oh, see, you know, it's got a magnificent. I'm not into orchids and bromeliads, but um, if you're into orchids and bromeliads, surely people are, are, are in America they go notice. This is almost like a, the, the leaves are here, very similar to that of, of a plantain, and see the leaves behind there, almost like a strawberry in a way. Yeah, so they got all this, you know, lovely chapters like this because we're going to focus on um, the chapter that's on the kind of plants, of course. But if you want me to focus on a particular chapter, um, sing out, because it's got some absolutely spectacular photographs in this book. It's an absolutely lovely book. They're finally doing what we wanted to do in my day, when in, in the 1970s, and when you grow up, books are going to be... Anyone can write a book. They'll be uh, cheap easily available and absolutely full of colour photographs. Well, that hasn't been the case up to now. They're more expensive. You still have to sort of do the old Beatles thing going down in, on the carpet in someone's office, almost begging to be able to allow, be allowed to write a book sort of thing. And they're basically just verbiage, you know, not, not many colour photographs, you know. It's all this blur, blur, blah, blah, blah. It's expensive to do colour photographs. So by the time it's all done, the profits aren't going to you, they're going to the people that actually printed the book. 
yeah, <laughs> the publishing companies. And I don't think that's the way we want it to be. So uh, that's why some people have gone down the self-publishing uh, route. You know, you know, the old black books. But uh, yeah, anyway, let's get out of this one. I want to get into, and you've got thing on invasive plants. That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, there's a chapter on just carnivorous plants. If, if I can find it, I should have put a bookmark in for this. But I thought, yeah, it's at the back of the book. We can't miss it. You know, it's quite a long chapter, uh, blah, blah. And I can't find it now. What's it? <sighs> They're all colours coded. You'd think I'd be able to find it. You know? Oh, here we go. I had put in a bookmark from the late Bob Such, such and such here. Yeah, look at the last photograph on his Facebook page. It's him standing in front of the Happy Valley Reservoir. So he knew where it was at. Yeah, Bob, we know you knew where it was at. So, you know, you're the man. You always will be the man in my, in my mind. Fighting to the very end. So, yeah, see, if we get to the front of the chapter, we see we've got a chapter on carnivorous plants. And look at that spectacular shot there. You know, as soon as you open the page, you think, ah, oh, now this is a book that knows where it's at. And, um, yeah. oh, I suppose you want me to, <laughs> you want to read all the blurb, and so on and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. blah, blah. Okay. Historical trade, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, pause the screen at your leisure. And, uh, so on and so forth. And you've got a lovely picture of uh, Jurassic Apprentice there. The other thing. Um, pictures of Venus flytrap growing in these sort of colony pot sort of arrangement. Probably with a special um, water and drain sort of plug. But there's more to it than that. We're probably going to find out. So, uh, when you go on Biblis, there's a lot of new Biblis species discovered. But remember, Biblis linifolia was discovered, or not, well, brought to the public's attention by Ricket Erickson. So, don't get this idea that the flowery did that. No, that was done in the 1960s, I believe, by Ricket Erickson in an article she published, first in the paper and then an actual. Um, in a journal sort of thing, so uh, yeah, don't let anyone pull that rubbish over you, you know. <laughs> yeah, like like some of the uh, ideas of Steve Rose, I been, think, have been inappropriated by the flowers. So, uh, but I do, do give him his credit with this idea that the traps of polypomflex are, are, are 180 degrees round the other way compared to utricularia. But then again, that might not be his idea. That might be a Steve Rose idea, but you know. Until, I think that's one of the reasons they didn't like um, people to read the old Carnivore's Plant Newsletter of Australia. Not many issues, but some of those articles in there gave the idea that it should actually be called Diana's Flytrap. And uh, some of these other ideas about the Carnivore's um, Cephalotus Bog or whatever and a few other things. And uh, yeah, so I think quite a lot of the work it was actually Steve Rose's work, so yeah, he hasn't been given the credit. I don't think he did. I don't think he's been given the credit. I think he deserves something. I see. You know, I would have liked a whole issue on Steve Rose or thing, but uh, yeah, nice picture of heading for. As I said, some of these I've tried two species, and the salt index, the salt fragment index, is just off the charts. Basically, it's like one. <coughs> one and one third seawater, which is probably why they are very brittle. But uh, yeah, we're getting ideas of um, why that is probably so. I think if you look at the color of the uh, tapuris, you know, black and brown at the top sort of thing, um, so it gives you some suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, people going into Nepenthes and they want you to buy these really expensive Nepenthes. It's all about size in a way. People like, you know, they sort of, they want big things. So, you know, if the most common sundew in Southern Australia did grow to the size of a hand size, we could hybridize it with something that could grow 
to hand side or something that was less ephemeral and more permanent, like, <laughs> like a tube was sundew or something, then they would sit up and take notice. But at the moment, they just think like it's an invasive weed, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, you know, this is quite, quite a good book. Lots of other chapters. Might have a quick flick through some of the other chapters for you, you know.